Let's go ahead and get started. I know some people are still coming in and that's fine. Good to see you back here. We have lots to cover since I didn't quite get done with Luther. We were ending last time by talking about three people. First, his wife, Catherine Van Bora or Katie, then the Dutch humanist Erasmus, who we'll say more about in this lecture, and then Zwingli, who will You'll get much more about him in just a few moments. But three controversies. If you are to give the bad news about Luther, and I'm, and I'm thinking even as, as Christians who like Luther and Protestants, three controversies in particular that leave something of a black mark on Luther's legacy. The first is the Peasants' War of 1525. And again, this will intersect with Zwingli and the Radical Reformation, which I'll explain more about. But there was a violent rebellion in 1525 in the German territories, and many of them assumed that Luther would have been supportive. Here is one of the main themes for today, and actually for the Reformation, and really for movements anywhere. Almost any time, you have some movement that is calling for really significant systemic change, there is going to be an offshoot of that movement that says you are not going nearly far enough. And so it is with the Reformation that they, these early reformers quickly found themselves on a two-front war. I mean that spiritually, but as we'll see with Zwingli, it also meant literally. So the Roman Catholic Church, we understand that. They were trying to reform the Catholic Church. They were in opposition, and the Catholic Church had excommunicated Luther. But then there is this other side that is calling for not just reformation, but revolution. So there's a massive revolt of the peasants, and they would have thought that, well, we're in the spirit of Luther and overthrowing the system and stick it to the man and Luther was absolutely appalled at the peasants' revolt. He did not see their revolution as a culmination to his project. They, he feared that they were the undoing of everything that he was about. No, 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 I'm not calling for social unrest and violent revolution. And to make matters worse, it's in this time with the peasants' war where the peasants are being slaughtered by the German nobility that Luther goes ahead and gets married and has a big party and he's just having the time of his life, considered very insensitive, and Luther called for the German nobility to crack down with whatever means necessary to crush this peasant's revolt. So some people would consider that a negative mark on Luther's legacy. Second is a controversy involving man I mentioned just briefly last week, and that is Philip of Hesse. In 1523, Philip married Christina of Saxony. So Philip is one of the, the, the nobility, one of the aristocracy. He's the one who called together the Marburg colloquy between Luther and Zwingli in 1529. Philip of Hesse. In 1523, Philip married Christina of Saxony. They had seven children together, but Philip was a serial adulterer. In 1539, he fell in love with Margaret von der Sale, who was 17 years old at the time, and he couldn't get a divorce. It's strange the things that, it's easy to think they were so much better then or so much worse back then, and it's almost always a combination. So they had absolute strictures about divorce, and we'll come to that uh, next week with Thomas Cranmer, of course, and Henry VIII. But mm, the serial adultery, of, well, that was just sort of happened, and of course they didn't, Luther didn't accept it, but it was there, and that's what especially men of high position often did. So he couldn't get a divorce, but he wanted to marry this woman, Christina. So Luther gave him the advice, okay, don't get a divorce, but make an exception, it's not the best, but go ahead and marry Margaret in secret, which he did in March 1540. 
Melanchthon and Bootser, two other reformers, were witnesses, but Luther got the blame for advising him and basically condoning bigamy, that Philip would have two wives. Uh, you want this wife, you can't get a divorce, just do it in secret, and you have two wives. The third controversy, and the one that would be most familiar to you, is Luther's comments, especially at the end of his life, about the Jews. We can try to absolve Luther of his language by pointing out that many, most people spoke very negatively about the Jews, but that hardly is a Christian excuse. We could also point out truthfully that earlier in his life, he was much more sympathetic toward the Jews. We could also point out that most of the worst things he said were recorded later in his life in Table Talk. Now, many of you have Table Talk, the Ligonier Daily Devotional. Well, it gets its name from this, which was Table Talk and was sort of, let's have people just transcribe and write down these conversations that Luther had. It's like Nixon thought, it might be a good idea to just have secret recordings of what I'm doing. Don't do that. Don't just have someone say, I have so many great ideas, just sort of off the cuff, everybody just... Uh, take it down. So much of what he said was in this sort of informal setting that then gets published as Table Talk. So you could try to put some of it in context, and yet there really is no excusing the language and the way in which Luther talked. It wasn't that he was against every Jewish person. In fact, his most notorious work at the end of his life called On the Jews and Their Lies was dedicated to a Jew who had converted to Christianity. So it wasn't, the, it wasn't a, an ethnic prejudice, but it was a harsh religious prejudice that then spilled over into all sorts of, we would say, ethnic stereotypes and anti-Semitism. His obsession with the Jews and what horrible, vile creatures he thought they were even shows up as an appendix to the final sermon he ever preached. I heard Carl Truman mention that R.C. Sproul had once said his, the, his favorite sermon outside the Bible was Luther's last sermon. Okay, it's a great sermon. And Truman said, well, I, I assume Sproul didn't mean the appendix that was added to the sermon when it was finally published, which was a rant against the Jews. What can we say except that Luther needed the grace of God and the righteousness that comes through faith alone? When we have our historical heroes, we ought to be honest about their faults. We don't have to try to excuse them. We can point out where they were wrong, just as if anyone cares to look at our lives, there will be things to emulate and things that we got wrong. In January 1546, Luther traveled back to the place of his birth, to that town Eisleben. He came there to settle a local dispute between two nobles. He was already sick when he left for Eisleben. Katie, his wife, was worried, and she had good reason to be. He went there. He preached four times, the last on either February 14 or 15. On February 16, Luther penned his last statement or probably dictated it to someone who wrote it down. And famously, his last written words ended with this. We are beggars. This is true. And it was an apt summary of the gospel rediscovery that Luther did so much to promote. His last recorded spoken words were Psalm 31, 5, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And he repeated that verse three times. On February 18, 1546, Luther breathed his last. 62 years old though most men would need at least twice as many years to do everything that Luther did. We won't read as much as Luther wrote. These people were absolutely astounding in their capacity. Luther saw his life as a conflict, among other things, with the devil. One of the books I held up last week, a very influential biography by a German scholar, Heiko Obermann, it's called Luther, Man Between God and Devil. And his thesis is perhaps a bit overdone, but he really shows that many of us tend to miss 
the frequency with which Luther talked about the devil. And it's easy for us to think, well, yeah, it's just kind of spiritual language, but he really saw the world haunted, I mean, in a spiritual way, by the devil and all of his works. He said in the preface to his Latin writings, what is not of God must of necessity be of the devil. He saw the work that he was doing to reform the church and especially to recover the doctrine of free grace and justification through faith alone and to do away with the whole system of merit and indulgences and penance and purgatory. He saw it as defeating the works of the devil. Mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing in Luther's most famous hymn. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. It's fitting that his most famous hymn, and he has others. If you were in the Lutheran church, you would sing others, but we, we know that one at least, is focused on the word of God to defeat the works of the devil. And just as a parenthesis, sometimes people say, oh, mighty fortress is our God. That was a a bar tune that they sang in the bars at Wittenberg. A mighty fortress is our, and they just got a flag in and they're, well, it's a bar tune as a musical term, like bars in a musical score. (laughs) It was not, he did not go into the bars. And so sometimes that's used as, we should just pick up whatever tunes we can. No, it, it was that musical bar, not of this kind of bar tune. But if you want to sing, if you can find a bar that sings it, then that's the bar for you. (laughs) Martin Luther, turning our attention, so much more we could say, but speeding on to this man. How many of you before this class had heard of Martin Luther? Yes. How many of you had heard of Ulrich Zwingli? ish. Oh, you've heard of him. How many of you know much about him? Ah, there. (laughs) You heard about him because he was in the write-up in the Sunday school material. (laughs) This, so we got a copy here, and if you want, this is a great biography. It's 300 pages. It's scholarly, but it's very readable. He's a good writer. This is by Bruce Gordon, who is a professor at Yale. He also has a fine biography on Calvin that came out in 2009. This one on Zwingli, came out in 2021. If you go to the podcast, and some of you may listen to Al Mohler's briefing, but his other podcast is Thinking in Public. Uh, When this book came out, so you gotta go back in the archives a bit, but he did an hour long conversation with Bruce Gordon about Zwingli. So if you get intrigued by this lecture and you're driving around, go back, Thinking in Public, two or three years ago, and you can get some of Bruce Gordon on Zwingli. Zwingli, we turn our attention now from Germany to Switzerland. In the 16th century, of course, there was no Switzerland. Instead, there was an alliance of 13 cantons. It's analogous to the states in the United States. Today, Switzerland has 26 cantons, then 13. The Swiss land, so even if we call it Switzerland, it, was, it wasn't a thing, but there was, with these 13 cantons, a Swiss confederation. So it gets a bit confusing, especially for Southerners, when you read Zwingli's biography, you're talking all about the Confederates, different Confederates. This Swiss confederation. The Swiss lands were relatively poor, not nearly as influential in Europe as the nations, and I use nations loosely, surrounding them. Think about Germany, France, Italy to the south, and then this little slice of land, the Swiss cantons. There were urban cantons. They were the richest and most powerful, Zurich, Bern, Basel, Schaufhausen, Lucerne, Freiburg, The two largest cities were Basel and Zurich, both with a population under 10,000. Most of these places we're talking about are not big. Zurich probably had a population of 6,000. The, you know, you, you have to go to China to get some really, really big cities. Now, London, it's a good size. Paris is fairly good size. But Zurich 
which will be the center of our story this morning, is only 6,000 people. This Swiss confederation began in 1291 as a means of these cantons, which are usually anchored by a city, but then they include this whole region, in 1291s as a means of economic and military support. They didn't necessarily have a lot in common, except they're all in this Alpine region, and they said, let's form a confederation together. We'll help each other economically, support each other militarily. In 1500, the whole confederation had about 600,000 to 800,000 people in all of the 13 cantons. Zurich would be the first to break away from Rome. I've never been to Zurich. Anyone here been to Zurich? Oh, very lovely place. I hope to visit sometime. Been to Geneva? I've not been to Zurich. It broke away in 1525. By 1529, Bern, Basel, Schaufhausen also decided for the Reformation. Now, you may mention or you may notice that in this list of some of the cantons, I did not mention Geneva, which is probably the city you think of most when you think of Switzerland. And it's there right on the border of France or Switzerland. I've been there a, a few times to, to speak, and they put me up at a hotel that's just over the border in France, and I get to go on a run from France to Switzerland. And it's just, <laughs> I feel amazing. And you know how many people are checking at the border? Zero. <laughs> just run right across. And... Um, Barry went with me one time. We could tell you the story that we flew all night and we got there and we said, we got to try to stay awake. Uh, let's go see Geneva. And I had in my mind, you know, it's like a six mile round trip. We could do that three miles down, three miles back. It was, I forgot, six miles there, well, more like seven. And uh, it was a very dumb thing to do to run a half marathon after flying all night. So we did <laughs> sleep well that night. Barry lost his credit card, but all's well that ends well. <laughs> It was the church credit card. So people in Geneva are living large. Thank you. <laughs> Geneva, however, was not one of these cantons. It did not join the Swiss Confederation until 1815. Geneva has its own unique history with a good measure of autonomy, though it allied with this Swiss Confederation. It was not a part of it until centuries later. Ulrich... Zwingli, or sometimes spelled like this, Aldrich Zwingli was born in the Toggenberg region in a little village called Wildhaus in today what is northeast Switzerland near the border of Liechtenstein and Austria. It was a poor alpine region, but absolutely stunning in beauty. If you think about, I think we may do this as a family, there's a, in 2015, a new Heidi movie came out. And so we haven't seen that, might be good for the kids, but if you've ever seen any of the Heidi movies or even The Sound of Music, though that's Austria, but not too far away from this, just picture those kind of stunning vistas of hills and dales and valleys and snow-capped mountains. Well, that's the place and the scenery that Zwingli grew up with. And he, did, and he had a love of nature and kind of a romantic, poetic side all his life. He was the third of ten children, six boys and four girls, just to outdo us. He had fond remembrances of his childhood. It seemed he had a happy home, a loving family. And though they were poor by any measure relative to us, they had some measure of prosperity uh, his father had developed as a successful farmer. He encountered humanism while studying in Bern and then in Vienna, and eventually he graduated from the University of Basel. So Ulrich Zwingli, should have given you his date. It's easy to remember. He was born New Year's Day on 1484. In 1586, he graduates with what we would call a master's degree from Basel. He encountered in his studies humanism. Now, what do we mean? We don't mean secular humanism. We hear that term and we think it's bad. But humanism, think this Renaissance Christian humanism that grew out of the 13th and 14th centuries. Humanism, 
was not a set of philosophical beliefs so much as it was a set of intellectual interests, especially about rhetoric in classic antiquity. So the shorthand, humanism think those who are interested in the humanities, those who are interested in the study of philosophy and rhetoric and all the things associated with ancient Rome in ancient Greece. There was a revival of this humanist tradition and Zwingli absolutely loved it. The study of history, grammar, rhetoric, poetry, moral philosophy. And in each of these subjects, the humanists wanted to revive the legacy of classical antiquity. So they said so much of what happened in the Middle Ages, of course, they didn't call them Middle Ages, uh, the scholastics, they said, just dealt with commentaries upon commentaries. It was just dealing with people commenting on each other. And what they wanted to do in this famous slogan, which became one of the Reformation slogans, ad fontes, which means to the fountains. The humanists said, back to the source, to the fountains. Let's not just read about Peter Lombard in what he said about something and then what Aquinas said about Lombard and what you say about Aquinas talking about Lombard. Let's go back to the Greeks and to the Romans, back to the sources. And with this also was an emphasis in Greek and Hebrew. Hardly anyone, even the scholars, knew Greek or Hebrew anymore. Greek had been quarantined off to the eastern part, the Byzantine Empire, and Greek, Hebrew, now there's a little bit of Aramaic as well in the New Testament or Old Testament, but Greek and Hebrew, there was a, a re-emphasis to study the Word of God in the original languages, and that meant a whole lot of scholarly work to try to pull together manuscripts and come out with editions of Greek and Hebrew that could be distributed and disseminated. The key person, as I mentioned last week, is Erasmus of Rotterdam, called the Prince of Humanists. By 1530, his books accounted for 10 to 20 percent of all book sales in Europe. He was a publishing phenomenon. He prepared new Latin texts of the Bible, new Greek texts of the New Testament. Later editions of Erasmus's Greek New Testament would be called the Textus Receptus. Sounds kind of like a dinosaur, but it just means the received text, the Textus Receptus, and that is the basis for the King James Version. Now, I love the King James. One of the reasons we don't use the King James, and this is a, a, a long-standing debate, but the King James is based on this manuscript tradition called the Textus Receptus, the received text. And after Erasmus, you might say, well, how could we get a better Greek New Testament the farther we get away from the New Testament? Well, because you find newer, well, new to us, but older, better manuscripts. And so Erasmus, that was a, a phenomenal feat, but what you would study or buy at the RTS bookstore is going to be a manuscript tradition, a little different than the received text. So one of the, 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 the differences between, say, the ESV and the King James, besides the older language, is, are the manuscripts that they think are the best Greek manuscripts to use. But Erasmus, no doubt, pioneered this whole study, and Zwingli was a huge fan. He had an Erasmus bobblehead doll. He had an Erasmus is my homeboy t-shirt. He loved, he was on his podcast, he loved Erasmus. He even wrote letters to Erasmus, and Erasmus wrote him back. Now, there was always a little bit, it seemed like, kind of fanboy right to Erasmus, and Erasmus sort of, you know, a little bit like... Mr. Incredible, like this with, uh, you know, well, syndrome, he turned bad. Zwingli didn't turn bad. Well, but we'll see. <laughs> he loved the study of all of this, and he threw himself into it. Now, as we'll see, like Luther, now Luther didn't even have a relationship with Erasmus. Zwingli did. But like Luther, Zwingli will eventually come to a point, and he'll say, for all of the brilliance of Erasmus, 
he was a fence sitter. Even today, if something is called Erasmian, it's usually not a compliment. It means a middle of the rotor, a fence sitter, because Erasmus never left the Catholic Church. He, though he ridiculed the Catholic Church, he always stopped short of where people like Luther and Zwingli wanted him to go. So Zwingli eventually will determine he's too tepid, he's too cautious. But at the very end of his life, if we have time to get there, we'll see that Zwingli wondered, hmm, maybe I was wrong about Eras Erasmus and Erasmus was right about Luther. So Zwingli graduates from Basel, he's ordained as a priest, and he is appointed to a parish, I know most of you can't read that, in a little town called Glarus, which is about 20 miles as the crow flies. Of course, it would take a lot longer to wind through the mountains to get there, but about 20 miles as the crow flies south of where he grew up. And he would be there in Glarus for more than a decade. And it was a happy, whoops, a happy time of his life from 1506 to 1516. He's the parish priest in Glarus. Part of what ended his time there, however, is that Zwingli, beginning in 1516, started to speak out against the mercenary trade. A military mercenary, mercenary, as you know, is someone who receives money by some other power to go fight for them. In the American Revolution, very hated were the Hessians, those mercenaries who King George was paying. Of course, the, the Hanoverians came from Germany and the Hessians were over here, so paid mercenaries. The Swiss had developed a reputation as being the fiercest fighters in Europe. It's not for no reason that in 1506, the Swiss Guard was established to protect the Pope. And that still continues today. One of, if not the oldest military unit in existence for over 500 years. The papacy said, where are the best fighters we can find? Well, obviously the Swiss. But Zwingli had his reservations, partly born of experience. He was a chaplain to the Swiss mercenaries and saw what they were like and saw the fighting that they did and saw the moral laxity. And he began to speak out against the mercenary practice. He considered that it was a way, a fast track to iniquity. We even have today, well, that person, you know, drinks like a sailor or swears like a sailor. Well, there was, for good reason, the reputation was you go off for missionary service, it, it, you're not going off to try to find the pure life. And he thought, well, it's one thing if you go off and you fight for your, your people, your family, your religion, your nation. It's another thing if you go and just take money to go kill other people. And he thought all we're doing is the bidding of these foreign powers, usually the French, and the Swiss were divided on whether they liked the French or not. And he spoke out against the mercenary trade. This was not a popular position. Why? Well, several reasons. One, when the French, and they were usually the ones paying for the mercenaries, who did they get? You might think, well, they went and just found the, the destitute rabble, but no, they usually went to the well-to-do families. And they would pay a handsome price to the leading families in Switzerland that they might give up their sons for military service. So many of the nobles liked this mercenary trade and Zwingli was hitting them in their pocketbook. Also, many young men, you're growing up, what are you gonna do? You're gonna live in this little town your whole life? You're gonna be a farmer? Well, you're 16, 17, 18. 20, you got an opportunity to go to some other part of the world, have an adventure, you hear stories, about, maybe you get to kill some Italians, whatever you're going to do. Uh, so it was a way for them to experience something of life. And there was a bit of national pride. Well, we're the Swiss. Even when Zwingli would talk about educational parameters for the young, they, he, 
it was a given that they needed to be trained in swords and they needed to be trained in military conquest. That was just a part of life. To be Swiss was you were a, a fighter. And so to strike at the mercenary trade was not popular. And it was one of the reasons that he left Glarus and he goes to another little town, which is hard to say, which is Einsilden. E. I N S E no I E it's the it's the reversing the Einsilden in 1516 I won't write it up there because I will forget how to spell it by the time I walk to the board <laughs> he served there for two years 1516 we'll just put uh, this Ein place <clears throat> to 1518 there was an abbey there a monastery but not much was happening with the monastery. Uh, in Glarus, he was in charge of 1,300 people. Here, 1,500 people. These were big churches. Now, why? Because everybody in the town was considered a part of the church and expected to be there and a part of the parish. So 1,500 people. But this monastery near this Ein town was pretty non-existent. So he had lots of time to study Greek. He taught himself Hebrew when even Erasmus wasn't very good at, at Hebrew. He studied, 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 he preached, and by all accounts in both places, he was a, a beloved, caring pastor. People could see he was an excellent student and scholar, he was a very good preacher, and he cared for people. He visited the sick, he visited homes, he was a good pastor in both of these places. Well, he hears in 1518 that there is an opening <coughs> in Zurich. Interesting, even then, you know, a pastor like Zwingli had thought on, well, Zurich, what could I do for the Lord if I could get to Zurich, the, the great leading city, Zurich and Basel, the two leading cities in the Swiss lands. He wanted to be the pastor, well, the priest, but we'll call him a pastor, at the leading church and those of you who have been to Zurich have, I'm sure, visited it. It's still a landmark today. The Grossmünster. Well, funny name to us, but it just means the Great Minster. Parentheses here. A cathedral is called a cathedral, be cathedra being the word for chair or throne. So a cathedral is the church where the bishop resides, where the seat of the bishop is. So if you are a bishopric, you have a cathedral. So even though Robert Schuller called it the Crystal Cathedral, it was not, a, usually cathedrals are those who have, who have bishops in their denomination. A minster, that word comes from monastery. So originally was a church that's connected to a monastery, but then minster becomes a kind of honorific for any large, significant church. So the York Minster in England, or we subscribe to the Westminster Confession, which is not the Westminster, but Minster, because it's from Westminster Abbey. And Minster here means an important church. So the Gross Munster was the great Minster there in Zurich. And he wanted the job badly, he sent letters by back channels to find out what was happening and would the city officials pick him. At one point, he said he would be so embarrassed if he was beaten out for this post by some, quote, flatulent and windy Swabian. A Swabian is someone from Upper Germany. A flatulent and windy Swabian. Just put that in to your... Insult. There is something online, at least there used to be, an, a Luther insult generator that you could just go on and it would sort of roll, spin the wheel, and it would come out with a great Luther insult. Well, here was a Zwingli insult. He wanted to be there, but here was the hang-up. And this is just one of those unseemly parts of the Reformation and Zwingli in particular. He was a brilliant scholar, a hardworking pastor, a gifted preacher. So it would have made sense he would end up at the Gross Munster. The problem was it was quite well known and, and rumored that he had been a philanderer at both Glarus and Einsilden. 
Remember, clergy aren't allowed to, ma to marry. That, he will get married uh, in 1524, so that's coming. But clergy had to be celibate. But you know how many clergy were celibate? Not very many. It was basically an open secret and openly allowed that ministers, ministers, that priests would often have live-in de facto wives. Sometimes not very fairly or flatteringly, they were called priest whores, not flattering. But it was, in many places, it was rather commonplace that, okay, the Pope says you can't get married, but, yeah, all these priests, we see that they are married. Quasi-clerical marriages were the norm. It's estimated in the Diocese of Constance, which is the, the Catholic diocese that included Zurich, in the early 1520s, there were 1,300 children from priests. The bishop collected money for each one, so it's probably one of the reasons that the Catholic Church often looked the other way, because it was another means to tax the people. So in order for those illegitimate children to be baptized and made legitimate, they needed to pay a cradle tax. So this was very common. However, it would be one thing if Zwingli had a common law wife, but it wasn't just that. He was a serial fornicator. When the leaders in Zurich asked if he had a particular dalliance in his last parish, he said, well, yes, I did have sex with the daughter of a barber, but I did not sleep with the daughter of a leading citizen of the city. He defended his promiscuity by saying he never slept with a virgin, a nun, or a married woman. Okay, so I, I, didn't, I didn't, I was just, we would say it, 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 it's sexist, but he's saying, look, I didn't, I mean, I didn't sleep with any pure women. So prostitutes, probably women who already had a reputation or were sexually active. I didn't sleep with virgins or nuns or married women. He admitted in a 1522 sermon, he said to the congregation, now he's at Grossmünster, if you hear that your pastor has sinned with pride and gluttony and unchastity, you should believe it. But I have never put the teaching of the word of God for sale. Part of his other defense, not very compelling, is that when he was at Einsielden, he was a confessor. That is, the people and other priests or church officers would come and he would hear their confessions. And he said, if you knew what all the other priests are doing and what everyone is doing, you wouldn't think that this is such a big deal. Seems that not only clerical, quasi-clerical marriages, but even that men of the city might have these kinds of sexual dalliances, though not approved, could sort of be looked at the other way. So Zwingli did regret it. He did express remorse for it. But from our vantage point, it doesn't look like there was a lot of remorse. It was sort of, well, I had reasons and I'm sorry. Thankfully for Zwingli, the other candidate had six illegitimate children. So Zwingli was chosen for the post at the Grossmünster despite that sordid past. Now it does seem when he came here, as far as we can tell, he put those philandering ways behind him. He would eventually be married in 1524 to his wife, uh, what's her name, Anna. And when he was married officially to Anna, she was almost due with their first child. So he'd already been living with her in one of these open kind of quasi-clerical marriages. It seems to have been a fine enough arrangement with his wife, though we don't get any sense of the kind of romance and spark and love that Katie and Martin had with each other. So he's chosen for this position, and on January 1, 1519, he begins serving in Zurich. <clears throat> and he does something that he had already been doing in Einsielden, but now he does it in the, the city, and it's 
you can say without exaggeration, it changes the church. And we all have to stand in Zwingli's debt for what he did on January 1, 1519, because he went up to preach in the Gross Munster and he put away the lectionary for, for centuries. The church gives the lectionary. Now, some church traditions still use it, and, you know, there's, it's not like you can't get the gospel from the lectionary. But you were told to preach through, you go to this text and this text, and you're, you're, you're locked into this church calendar. And he said, I'm not doing the lectionary. I'm going to preach verse by verse, chapter by chapter through books of the Bible. This was revolutionary. So he started in Matthew, and he just preached those verses, and then the next week he did the next verses, all the things that we've done for 40 plus years at this church. The council, the leaders in Zurich, supported him in this. They supported him when he put aside the lectionary, and his reform efforts could not have taken place without the support of the council and the leading men of the city. One of the reasons they did support him, he was brought there in part by the anti-French forces. Remember the, he's against the mercenary trade. Well, that kind of hits at the French. So there were some who are pro-French. There's some who are anti-French. One of the things that will really dog Calvin in Geneva is he, it, Calvin is French. And a lot of Geneva is anti-French. And when I say dog Calvin, I mean literally people started naming their dogs Calvin. And not like how we do the cute little thing. Oh, here, Piper or something, you know. No, they didn't. These were, you know, rabid dogs running around. It's like naming your raccoons or something. So he was brought to the city and he begins to reform. Zurich was not home to a bishop. It did not have a university like Basel or Wittenberg. It was not a great financial or economic center, though today it's known for that. What power it possessed came from the fact that it had a large land area. So Zurich is the city, but it's also the canton, which includes a large rural territory along Lake Zurich toward the Alps. Soon after he uh, arrives in 1519 and 1520, there's a plague and kills people indiscriminately throughout the city. In caring for the people, Zwingli, contracts the plague. Everyone, including himself, thinks that he's going to die. In response, he writes a piece called Pestiliad, Plague Song, and it's a beautiful piece of poetry reflecting on his trust in the sovereignty of God in the midst of the plague. And it's a good point here to say a little bit about Zwingli, as much as any of these reformers, had a poetic side to him. He was a gifted musician, all the contemporary biographers note he could sing very well. He played multiple instruments by one count, the lute, the harp, the violin, the pipe, the whistle, the trumpet, the dulcimer, the cornet, and any other horn. He was the Joseph Fukushan of his day. His supporters thought he was a musical savant, and they pointed to his artistic side to balance off, which could be his militaristic side, his opponents said, ah, he's an entertainer. He's consumed with frivolities. They even accused him of being effeminate. All of these musical instruments and songs. One of the many contradictions in Zwingli's life, you would think that given his musical proclivity, he would have a large place for music in the life of the church, but he didn't. When liturgical reforms took place, Zwingli did not allow for singing. Even though Wittenberg did, Strasbourg did, Basel did, he believed that it was too much a, an emotional fix or it was too much a part of the Catholic past. You know, he believed in music. He wrote songs, but he, he thought they were for private settings or they were for private contemplation or for family gatherings. He didn't have music in the church. After Luther is excommunicated in 1520, Zwingli concludes that Rome is the enemy of reform. Up to that point, he's actually quite loyal to the papacy, and he gets funded based on that loyalty. And he thinks that we can reform from within. But when Luther is excommunicated in 1520, he flips 
And now he moves, we would say, in a Protestant direction, though that's not the, the language he would have used. And he changes for hard and for good. Now, he didn't formally leave the Catholic Church, but he begins to refer to his Catholic opponents as papists. One of the insults to come out of the Reformation, the papists. After only a few years in Zurich, 1522, he resigns his official post. He said, I can't get paid by the Pope anymore. Now, he still continued to preach and lead the great Munster, but his official position is rather ambiguous. He's the leader of the congregation, but he, he doesn't have that official priestly status as far as the Catholic Church is concerned. The breaking point for Zwingli and for the Reformation in Zurich comes in March of 1522. Not often can we date it to a spe specific date, but here we can. March 9, 1522. There was about a dozen friends who were gathered, including Zwingli, and they did something that was against the law. In fact, the people who, many who did this would be thrown in jail for it and was considered a great offense to the church. You know what they did? They gathered and they ate sausages. Sometimes Zwingli is... You know, people are like, well, Luther and Calvin, they're the important guys. Zwingli was about sausages. That's not really fair. But this is sometimes called the sausage affair. Why was that scandalous? Because March, it's Lent. You are not allowed to eat meat in Lent. We still have this residual, when does the McDonald's filet of fish sandwich come back? It's always during Lent. I don't know. Are there are that many good Catholics still around here. I would think... If, if, if you're trying to, you know, punish yourself by not eating meat, eating a filet of fish from McDonald's is sort of a wash there. But they sat down and they ate sausages. It was a deliberate act of provocation. And even though Zwingli did not eat, he was there. He's the head of the Gross Munster, and he gave his blessing to it. Well, the council sides with him. He, he preaches from the pulpit about why we can eat sausages. He said, there's no verse in the Bible that says, that calls this, there's no Lent in the Bible. There's no rules against, we just have man-made rules here. And the magistrates support Zwingli's position. A few months later, Zwingli and 10 other priests petitioned the Bishop of Constance, so that's the diocese, to allow them to marry. The bishop, of course, denies their request, but they get married anyways, and Zwingli married Anna Reinhardt. As I said, they'd already been living together, and she was about six months pregnant. By this point, Zwingli is thoroughly, we would say, Protestant. He's against clerical celibacy. He's rejected papal authority. He embraces salvation by grace alone. He attacks the moral laxity of the clergy, which parentheses, is a bit rich considering his own history of moral laxity. He rejects the intercession of the saints. He rejects purgatory, penance, the veneration of Mary. And above all, if there's one driving ambition in his life, it's the authority of the scriptures to know the Bible in Greek and Hebrew, to teach the Bible verse by verse, to test everything against the Bible. Gordon says in, in his biography that that was the driving ambition and it was his great strength and maybe a great weakness that he believed if people could only hear the word, they would surely be converted and their lands would be reformed. Now that's a great confidence in the word, but it also meant that it led to military action at the end of his life in order for the gospel to be proclaimed. In 1525, the council in Zurich officially abolishes the mass. Well, let's speed ahead and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we probably won't, but we'll do our best here in these 15 minutes to finish. Uh, I, I need to say something about an offshoot from both Luther and Zwingli, which today we call the Radical Reformation or the Anabaptists. Now that's not the name they called themselves. Anna is a Greek prefix meaning again. So they were called Anabaptists because they were 
baptizing people again. Now, they didn't see it as baptizing people again because the Anabaptists rejected infant baptism. Now, Zwingli, Luther, well, they're, Anna, they're baptizing people a second time. The Anabaptists said, no, you, infant baptism doesn't count. Baptists, I'm sure we have some Baptists in here, do not come from the Anabaptists. The Baptists come from Reformed Anglican offshoot uh, in, the, in the 1600s. Anabaptist tradition, Amish, Mennonites, those would be the Anabaptist tradition. But these are the first people who, say, who reject infant baptism. And they thought that Zwingli might be on their side. And if I can put on my Baptist hat, which I don't like to wear for very long, but just put on, you can understand some of these people were saying, now, Zwingli, you're right. We need to test everything against the Bible. And I don't see any infant baptism in the Bible. Why are we doing infant baptism? And they thought Zwingli would have said, you're right. But he said, N absolutely not. And he developed, probably the first to develop, a real covenantal understanding of baptism. And he said, no, well, here are all the reasons because of Old Testament to New Testament and our place in the family of God and the covenant. And so he argues against them with that. There were two offshoots. And there's some, the, the Radical Reformation is often considered the left wing of the Reformation because they rejected top-down authority, they rejected hierarchical conceptions of the political and the ecclesiastical sphere. And they developed in, in two fronts. So Saxony, reacting to Luther, and then in Zurich, reacting to Zwingli. So in Saxony, you have men like Thomas Munster, Andreas Karlstadt, Remember, he was on the faculty at Wittenberg, and when Luther came back from the castle, he finds that Karlstadt has taken this Reformation in a direction Luther didn't like at all. So Munster, Karlstadt in Saxony, and then in Zurich, one of the leading men is Conrad Grebel. There's no way around it. This is a tragic, tragic bit of Reformation history. Now, I'm reformed, I don't agree with the Anabaptists, I don't agree with Conrad Grable, but on a human level, it is tragic. Zwingli and Grable were close friends. They were allies in the trenches, reforming the church in Zurich. And then they, they break, not just on infant baptism, that would be just one element, but on all sorts of things about, are we doing a reformation or a revolution? Are, 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 do we wanna work with the, the magistrates, or do we throw off the yoke of the magistrates? Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, sometimes you hear the term, they are called the magisterial reformers or the magisterial reformation. Now, magisterial because it's great authority, but, but more than that, because these were the reformation efforts that believed in working with the magistrate. So that reformation was done through the prince, through the council, through the nobles, through the king. The radical reformation, as opposed to the magisterial reformation, said, no, we don't believe in working through the secular authorities. In fact, we don't believe in this top-down authority in the church or in the state. Grable challenged Zwingli to a debate. Zwingli accepted. Now, not surprising, in Zurich, Zwingli was declared the winner. In 1525, Grable was told, just drop this matter of infant baptism. You know, we're, we're for infant baptism, just stop it, okay? You lost to Zwingli, move on. And he responded in defiance by baptizing another reformer, Georg Blaurock, in the home of a third reformer, Felix Mance, on January 21. See, history depends on if you're... On the side of the reformers, and the Bishop of Constance says, you can't get married. We're like, yeah, just get married anyway. Well, now the council in Zurich says, just drop it. You, drop your Anabaptist ways. And they're like, eh, we're going to baptize each other anyway. And they're like, eh, well, maybe you should have listened. Uh, it depends which side you're on, whether you think it's an act of hubris and revolution or an act of God-given courage and defiance. So he baptizes as an adult. These, and it's these three men who are 
instigated. Mance, Blaurock, and his friend Grable. The, they also have connections. This is 1525 that all this is happening. What else is happening? The peasants revolt. So everyone, this is not, it's never just a theological issue. It's not just, eh, it's these people are connected to Munster. They're connected to the peasants revolt. These are insurrectionists. These are sedition. These people are going to start a civil war. That's how they view it. In 1526, after these men flee, Mance, that's where the baptism happened in his home, was found and arrested. Denial of infant baptism had been made a capital offense in Zurich. On January 5, my anniversary, 1527, he was bound hands and feet and pushed into the Limmat River just outside the Gross Munster. Perversely, it was considered his baptism, death by drowning. He became Zurich's first Anabaptist martyr. Protestants and Catholics all believed, they assumed suppressing heretics was a matter of societal survival. One of the saddest stories involves a German Anabaptist, Balthasar Hubmeier. In 1525, Hubmeier unwisely showed up at Zurich. And he's arrested by officials and he's called upon to recant. And he did recant, but later he recanted his recantation. And to make matters worse, you can't make these stories up. He's in Zurich. He's known Anabaptist. He recants it. And then he's given a, you know, a script to read. Okay, here's, we've gone over this. You're going to read your repentance from the Gross Munster on Sunday. So in an act of great drama, I don't know if he literally ripped it up, but instead of reading, I'm sorry for being an Anabaptist, I repent, I don't believe that anymore, he ditches that script he was supposed to say, and he says, I'm not sorry for it, and here's why infant baptism is wrong. Again, an act of stupidity or bravery, depending on your perspective. He was imprisoned, and he recants again and is released, and he's expelled from Zurich. They say, we don't want anything to do with him. Eventually, Hubmeier is arrested in Austria, and he's burned at the stake in Vienna in 1528. Three days later, they find his wife, and they drown her in the Danube River. Between 1525 and 1625, scholars estimate between 1,000 and 5,000 Anabaptists were executed. So you say over a century, that's ah, not many, but it's still a, a, a tragic offshoot of the Reformation. During those years, and we won't quite get finished here, but we'll at least bring it up to the very end and it'll be a bit of a cliffhanger. During those years, as you can imagine, Zurich and the magistrates in Zwingli are struggling to contain the people. Like I said, when you have something fomenting as much social, religious, cultural upheaval as the Reformation, you're bound to have people who say, you're, you're weak sauce. <laughs> you're not going nearly far enough. And one of the big issues was iconoclasm, meaning the destruction of icons or statues. So all of these Catholic churches, they have statues of the Virgin Mary. They got relics of the saints. They have paintings of Jesus. They have all this iconography. What do you do with it? Well, Zwingli and the magistrates say, we're going to do this orderly. We're going to work to convince the priests. In time, we're going to, we're going to get rid of this stuff. We're going to take it down. We're going to work the Reformation slowly and orderly. A whole lot of people say, uh-uh. What did the prophets and what did the good kings do in the Old Testament? They tore down the high places. They went and smashed the altars of Baal. And so a whole bunch of the people go, ransack the churches, destroy the idols, Say, well, what, what are we doing? We're, we're destroying the idolatry in our land. By one estimate, the parchments, the silver and the gold artifacts, the books, the manuscripts that were destroyed, Gordon estimates were worth more than 25,000 goldens. Now, a golden, well, that doesn't mean anything to us. Well, Zwingli, as the leading cleric in the city, made less than 100 goldens in a year. So what's that, 250 times as much? So this is a lot of money, 25,000 goldens worth of material 
destroyed. The liturgical calendar was stripped bare. A few holidays are left, Christmas and Easter. The monasteries and the nunneries are turned over. Buildings aren't destroyed, but they become hospitals or sold off and the proceeds are given to the council. So the magistrates do like this is a big financial windfall for them. They get the lands that the church had. The monks and the nuns have to find other places to work. Zwingli also moves decisively away from Erasmus at this point. Though, just to give you a little hint for next week, Luther, by the end, will come to such blows with Zwingli that when Zwingli, see, Zwingli was forced to choose between Erasmus and Luther, because Erasmus and Luther had a falling out. Zwingli would say, and there's still a debate among scholars to this today, how much was Zwingli dependent upon Luther? Luther would say, yeah, entirely. Zwingli and the Swiss say, well, no. Zwingli, for his part, said he came to the doctrines of free grace independent of Luther. Probably a little exaggeration, but it is true that Zwingli came to his Reformation principles more through Erasmus. The Greek Bible, the Word of God, preaching, teaching, humanism, than by Luther. But he saw Luther as a hero. And when Luther and Erasmus split, Zwingli has to choose, and he chooses Luther. But at the end of his life, as he's treated so poorly by Luther, he wonders if he had made the wrong decision. He says, now I realize how prudent Erasmus's admonitions were. I imprudently turned Erasmus into my enemy for the sake of Luther, who is less conciliatory and less likely to be a friend. And Luther did not consider Zwingli a friend. So just, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll end here and then we'll, we'll do Zwingli's death next week. But I already mentioned the Marburg Colloquy, remember 1529, the Luther and Zwingli, they come together, they agree on 14 and a half of the points, but they can't agree on the real presence of Christ at the Lord's Supper. But if, it wasn't just that. See, in Luther's mind, he, he, had little, he, he didn't know much about Zwingli. He didn't care about Zwingli. It's like New York City and flyover country or something. What? I don't know who you are. Zwingli cared a lot about Luther. Zwingli wanted to be friends with Luther. I'm not trying to over-psychologize it. But there was also the fact that the Swiss lands had something to gain by an alliance with Germany. Where the Germans and Saxony thought, we have only to lose by being associated with Zwingli. Have you heard about the madness coming out of Zurich? Do you know about the rebellion? Do you know about these Anabaptist radicals? They blamed Zwingli for all of that. So Luther and the Germans said, we have nothing to gain. They went to that Marburg colloquy, certainly with no real intention of forming an alliance. Zwingli probably had the door opened just a crack. Maybe, possibly, we can come to some agreement. Zwingli, one of the differences between the two, Zwingli was so enamored with ancient writers, Zwingli thought he would see many virtuous pagans in heaven. Luther didn't think he would see Zwingli in heaven. It's true. It was not just theological, it was personal, it was political, it was national. For Zwingli, Luther had gone from his great hero. It is sort of like in Mr. Incredible. You were my hero and now you haven't given me the time of day and in fact you've divided the body of Christ because you're a hothead. Zwingli thought Luther had insecurities. He said, how come he's so bullish and belligerent and how come he's so anybody criticizes him and he goes off on them? He must be dealing with lots of insecurities to use our modern language. Luther for his part said Zwingli absolutely does not believe the Bible because Christ said this is my body. What could be simpler than that? It's my body. So it's the body. Now, not transubstantiation, but it's the body of Christ. Now, I don't want to, you know, he thought, well, Zwingli and the reform side were saying, yeah, but that's a logical contradiction. Luther said, yeah, what, what, what are, is reason your whore? We got the Bible. He thought it was a different God, a different way of understanding Scripture. And from our vantage point, you think you were so close but 
For Luther, they were miles and miles away. When the two sides couldn't agree fully on the question of the Lord's Supper, famously, Zwingli broke down in tears, expressing a desire for friendship. Luther wrote back to his wife, Luther's wife, we do not want them as brothers and members of Christ, although we wish them peace and good things. And later he would reflect in his table talk when someone asked, what do you think about Zwingli? He said, I wish that I could say he was in heaven, but I think that his errors were damnable. Next week, we will find the dramatic conclusion. How did Zwingli die? Because unlike Luther and Calvin, he did not die in his bed, surrounded by friends and well-wishers, weeping for their great hero. He died an ignominious death on the battlefield. Come next week to find out.